Thank you so much for coming tonight. I'm Stephanie and I'm part of the Inside Out team. Inside Out is proudly the RCA's only student-led lecture series, and we celebrate the extraordinary design professionals that shape our world with discussions and lectures designed to break the designer's mold and show young designers entering the industry the myriad of choices that they have in crafting a dynamic, meaningful, and interesting career. Inside Out tries to differentiate itself from other lectures by shifting the content from something polished to more of a discussion platform that confronts the ebbs and flows, glamour, glitz, and grit of being an industry. Tonight, we have Simon Hamilton, Kazumasa Takada, Pierre Shaw, Owain Karada Davies, and Amelia Jane Hankin, joining us from diverse professional backgrounds, ranging from set design, bespoke interiors, research, recruiting, and social design practice. They'll be talking candidly about their, their career decisions, unexpected turns, pitfalls, and all. Our guests are asked to share advice and personal experience about getting started in the field, any valuable lessons learned, and share any professional insight, and look forward to a dynamic conversation moderated by our very own Alex Ellerkamp and Evgenia Thank you, Stephanie. Um, so my name is Alex. And I'm Yudgenia. Uh, we're in our second year here at RCA. And to start things off, we would like to hear from each of you what you believe is at the very core of your practice and three words that you would use to describe them. So if there's anybody that would like to kick it off with a brief summary of your practice and then kind of a summarized three word kind of the, the core values or yeah yeah, I'll go yeah first. Go hi everyone uh, thank you very much for the introductions as well um i think the core of my uh, uh my practice is uh research that's underpinned by teaching um it's a cross between art interiors architecture um and lots of that research is looking at obsolescence demolition um they're, they're sort of my core elements of practice um in terms of the three words the human spatial uh, relationships between humans and space, um, cross-disciplinary and multidisciplinary, and um, site-responsive works as well. That's my three words. Great. Shall I go just, next? We can just go down the line. Okay, yeah, we'll just go down the line. So I would say a summary of what is at the core of my practice is uh, I'm an interior designer, and I really um, approach projects to be um, practical, comfortable and colourful. Um, those are kind of my three words as well. And it's also about collaboration. So I work a lot with other people, other designers, other architects. And that's something that has been throughout my um, kind of you know, career, which is quite wide ranging. I've done a lot of different things through my um three decades in design they've always been focused around design and I'm very um I suppose very active in the world of uh diversity and inclusion that's something that's very key to me in everything I do and I do a lot of work on that side so yes that's also important to me about equality uh giving people opportunities and encouraging them as well Hello, my name is Kazumasa. I'm running an architectural design practice called Pan Projects, and these are our works. Um, we started our studio in Copenhagen in Denmark in 2017 by winning that pavilion, paper pavilion, then decided to move the entire base of our studio from Copenhagen to London in 2019, um, where we start um, engaging international projects from here. Um, our practice is um, capitalized by constructing a story that can be told through observing the materials that we use. So we use papers or like we sometimes use like ocean plastics to unpack the stories that are hidden behind those materials. Um, the three keywords is fabrication and, and collaboration and multidisciplinary, I think. Thank you. <laughs> Hi team, um, so I'm Amelia. My practice spans performance design. So I'm a set and costume designer and work predominantly in the, the theatre industry. Been doing that for quite a while, about 10 years now. Um, I guess my, after a long time of working out what it is I love to do within that industry, very recently sort of comes to the conclusion that my work specialises in or intensifies in new writing um immersive storytelling and working with communities and, and young people and sort of collaboration with those so that's my 
jazz. Um, also, my practice is teaching. So I, I've taught for six years now. I taught at the University of Brighton before I came here. Um, I've taught undergraduate for sort of years one, one to three. Um, I also mentor people, um, various people, sometimes people that are associated with theatres that are looking specifically to get into doing theatre design or production design. Um, and sometimes mentor people that are just interested in studying spatial design. And I guess through that work, I try and uncloak in a way what it is to be a spatial designer and how to forge that path into it. Over to you. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> hey, everyone. Um, so I guess a summary of my practice, I am I'm a practicing architect, um, having done that for seven, eight years now. Um, was working at a practice called Howard Tompkins, but now sort of left that on my, on my own. Um, so I'm doing that alongside some PhD research into um, pedagogy, so teaching and, and being an educator and um, how to put program together um, around my interest, which is in critical design and uh, social led uh, design projects. Um, and that sort of culminates in um, my main sort of day-to-day -day practice, which is as an educator and um, runner of School SOS. So this is a project that I set up as a colleague, um, which explores this idea of what critical design really is. Um, so I'd say my three, and we can kind of come on to that maybe a bit later, but my three words are, um, I, I could say probably summarised experimental, critical, um, and collaborative. Sorry, I, Kazi. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot my three words. And one of those words. Go ahead. Jump in. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Collaborative. <laughs> 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 uh, storyteller. Uh, accessibility. Collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing. So it is quite evident that all you come from an array of backgrounds and have taken different paths to this moment in time. But the decision to enter academia students is what creates a connection between all of you. So my next question to you is what was your biggest motivation for becoming a tutor? And how does tutoring coexist with your other professional work? Can I comment on that one? Please, first of all? Okay. Um, I would say that when I first had an experience of tutoring, teaching, or being in front of a class, um, I realized that it was probably the most rewarding thing that I'd ever done. And I, I have a very wide ranging career. I've been a recruitment consultant. I've managed a, a, a studio of architects. I've managed a showroom for a supplier. And I've obviously worked for myself and I've worked for other people. But out of all those different things, it was when I got the opportunity to teach, and that was a very short period. I think it might have just been a week, and I've done that over the last 10 years. And it's been really something that's been with me for quite some time in that I think that's the thing that I really enjoy, is sharing knowledge, talking to people, listening to people. And when I was a recruitment consultant, I really kind of, in some ways, I hated it because it was a sales job and you're selling people. And that's probably the most unreliable thing you can sell. But the thing that I did like about the aspect in terms of putting people forward for roles and jobs was the nurturing, the mentoring, the talking to people, listening to their stories and finding out about what motivated them and how I could help them in that side. So what I do now is advise people and I've taken out the sales bit. So me being here at the RCA feels like a culmination of a lot of different things over time. And it's probably the most satisfying. I look forward to it. Um, I don't sort of think, oh, I'm just going to the LCA. It's not really, in, in, you know, something that I want to do. It's actually very, very rewarding for me. And it's, it's also particularly good because the roles I had before, as I said, in teaching were quite short term. So I would get say a seven week project at Centres and Martins where they brought somebody like me in as an interior designer on a product course because they wanted a different perspective, but that didn't continue. Um, I'm a visiting lecturer at the Interior Design School London, which is a private interior design school. Um, but for me, this is like, the, you know, 
cherry on the cake kind of thing. So I'm extremely happy to be here. So I teach two days a week uh, in this place. And this is the first year that I started teaching. So this is something new to me. Uh, why I decided to teach in here is because um, after I've been running my studio for about six years now, then after five or six years, I kind of like started thinking about um, why don't I, or like why don't we start like our own research project in our studio to develop our own concept and target or develop our own ideas inside our studio? Because we have like lots of lots of different ideas happening all the time, but we didn't have um, time to really think that seriously. So in this year, we decided to go into the academic, going back to the academic to start those research. Then in order to do that, I wanted to be inside the community. I thought that could be a really good start. Um, and also I really interested in teaching, going back to school and meeting those like young talents to um, work with. I really see like, I really enjoy teaching um, this year. And I see this as kind of like a collaboration. So I suddenly got like 40 different collaborators um, tackling like really interesting projects. So that nearly helps me to develop my own ideas. And also um, going back to like a client, like a commission work in the studio. So back and forth, really inspiring. It's fun. Yeah, I think um, for me, my background, um, whilst I was doing an MA, um, I was also a student welfare mentor. So I was able to talk to many students um, at one-to-one -one level and talk about their time at university, uh, any challenges, struggles that they had. And um, I saw hundreds of students um, during that time. And, and for me, that sort of one-to-one -one contact, that one-to-one -one connection with students, but also um, understanding for myself being a student and, and talking to these students that there's so much happening uh, during your time uh, in education as a student. Uh, outside the sort of academic side of teaching uh, there's always so much other things so many other things happening um, in the background and and for me that was important so to become a, te uh, a tutor a uh, lecturer at a university um, with knowledge of that and, and a background in that so a mental health first aid trained um, and, and that's something that's incredibly important to me as, as an academic is, is to recognize that as, as a really sort of large part of, of teaching. Um, but as well as that, uh, and also whilst I was studying on my MA, um, I had some incredible tutors, uh, one tutor particularly, Julia Dwyer, who was um, really inspiring and um, I guess a tutor that, that wouldn't necessarily sort of direct uh, their knowledge at you, but, but rather understand uh, who you are, what you're about, and how you can take that and, and take your own journey or path as a student. Um, and, and she was really helpful uh, in that process uh, for me to become a tutor. Uh, but since then, I've worked at many universities, undergraduate level, postgraduate level, um, and I absolutely love it. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. And at the moment, that takes up uh, lots of my time. Yeah. I, um, I, like you, I went like I think I was really privileged to have had some really great teachers in my life um, through undergraduate, through postgraduate, and then through sort of mentoring. I'm not sure if I actively ever decided to become a teacher. Um, it was maybe more a sort of, well, uh, conversation with a gem that started to happen. That's something that I might have to have a go at. Um, so I had a really, when I did my undergraduate in architecture, I had a really difficult time transitioning into it. So at first year, I found really hard. I almost got thrown off the course, didn't show up, didn't do the group work, et cetera. Um, and then I was actually taught by Jem in my second semester. Um, I'm not sure that in the first semester, it's not that I didn't understand what we were being taught, but it was the way we were being taught it. And I think, anyway, so it, it all shifted and changed once I was being taught by Jem. It made a lot more sense to me. And I found my sort of fulfillment through it um, and understanding or started to understand what spatial design is. And I went on to really enjoy it. Um, and I really enjoyed my three years doing it. But in a strange way, at the end of that, I had a really difficult time transitioning out of studying that. And we had no future practice or anything like that when I was at uni. There was no, you know, if you were doing architecture, it was assumed that you'd go on to do part one. Um, or sorry, yeah, go on to continue your training. There was no other option. There's no conversation about it. And I started to find, and like I, um, the theatre thing was something I just 
in a way stumbled upon from spending time in London. Um, and I spoke to my tutors about saying that, oh, I don't want to do architecture. I'm actually really interested in doing set design. And, and it was awful. And they were like, you, you know, why would you do that? Like, you're not going to earn enough money. Um, you've got a good degree. Why aren't you going to be an architect? All this, this and this. And I think like, in a way that <laughs> it's, it centers around future practice, but it, I don't want anyone to ever experience that. And I want everyone to know that it's okay to not know what the fuck you're going to do next. Or like, what we all do changes throughout our lives. And I think it's also okay to do a really good degree or postgraduate and go and work in a bar for a bit, or just go and think about it rather than this pressure to go into office or into practice. So like, I think that's, yeah, that's the main driving point. And I think how it influences my work is really refreshing coming and spending time with, with you guys or with any students. And I feel like when I'm tutoring you, we're churning out like 25 ideas a day. And then when I go back and try and get my ideas going, it's like, oh, okay, I did this 25 <laughs> times yesterday. <laughs> I can do this now. Yeah. Um, and then to be really honest, what it does is the money I earn through, through teaching helps support myself. It allows me to be more selective on the other work I choose to do. Because I think when you start out freelance, you take all the work because it's money. And mm -hmm. what's happened over the last five, six years is I'm able to go, oh, actually, I don't need to do every show. These are the shows I want to do. So... They work hands in hand in that way for me. Nice. I guess it's just be left. Um, I'd just say that is really nice to hear everyone's different yeah, perspectives great. on that. Though. I don't know you. <laughs> it's actually it's kind of a bit, you know, it's also like validating because I share a lot of those sentiments. So it's really just nice. So. <laughs> um, but I would say that the, the thing that got me into tutoring was um setting up school west west with my colleague kish and like any great idea um it's started after the sort of fourth pint at the pub <laughs> uh and um probably well no definitely very naively thinking right we're, we're really into politics and changing the world how do we change the world <laughs> um and we were thinking actually you know teaching is a moment where you can help potentially and be involved certainly in in someone's life when they're making the, the decisions about where they're going and how they're going to shape the future and for me that's just completely inspiring to be kind of a part of that and to be able to kind of um help guide that or get, help guide people in that kind of decision making and their careers and what they want to do um is is in a way kind of shaping the world and i think that is goes really to the heart of why why we set up school west west and um also you know what, what critical design is which you know really just around politics and work thinking about how how can design do better like how can it actually tackle or fix or challenge some of the issues that are um that we're having to deal with out there so yeah that's that was kind of how how i got into it at least <laughs> great um so kind of on a similar topic we want to stay in the realm of academia with the next section um interior design is relatively a new field within the academic world and according to an article that I found on the RCA website, um, so I'm hoping it's pretty accurate, um, the interior design postgraduate program here at the RCA was actually not started until 2012. Um, so that's just kind of surpassing the 10 year mark now. Um, and as many of you kind of studied architecture as undergraduates, I think we wanted our panel wants to know um, why you decided to become a tutor specifically in interior design and then kind of a larger picture of where you see the trajectory of um, architecture and interior design academia. Hmm. Maybe I can start that. I, I thought like this question was quite interesting because um, you say you see interior design and architecture is quite different thing. But what we teach here is quite similar. Uh, and I remember like one or like the first day I came here uh, with Steve, uh, he showed me around this summer exhibition and the glass vision works. So there's like architecture departments and also intelligent design courses. And I was like walking around, then it looks like the intelligent design course is pretty much similar to what I do, or like what the contemporary architects 
is Tatsang. And then like architecture department is kind of doing interior projects more or less. It's quite an interesting combination. Um, I don't see the difference anymore with the interior and the um, architecture um, academia, in, at least in the academia. It's a bit different in the reality. But then, um, yeah, this question was quite interesting. Um, how you see, like, why did you make this question? It's also kind of my question. But what I say is, <laughs> yeah, because I, I'm kind of surprised at this. <laughs> but then, like, why? Um, what's the difference in interior design and architecture? Is um, what I say, like, as an academia or as a school or education. Like, here is like, there's so many different like spatial designers, so to say, in this course. So that's so interior design is more about like space oriented, but something not like consolidated as a concept, I think. So that is what's the beauty of this course, I think, in this interior design. I don't like this interior design maybe anymore because it's more about like a spatial design of what we teach in there. So there's an architect, there is a set designer, there's like really like a different, different uh, type of designers, spatial designers in this course. Then like what happening in the architecture school nowadays, I feel is we are kind of like redefining architecture, like the concept of architecture. What is architecture, right? Mm -hmm. So then it's one of the question, like one of the answer could be this internal design course, what we learn and what we output from this course could be one of the new type of architecture, right? So that's something what I don't know, um, I'm thinking about. <laughs> yeah, what about. Yeah, I mean, I feel I resonate quite a lot uh, with this. I mean, um, with my own background, I did start off uh, with a degree in architecture, and but throughout doing that degree, I, I realized that um, maybe there was sort of lots of uh, pressures and, and rules in place um, that were put in place by bodies that might accredit those courses. Um, so I, I did complete that degree, but then um, you know, moving forward, I really wanted to do interiors, interior and spatial design. Um, so I, I began a course, an MA course in that. And to me, that was almost like a specialism where I was able to really spend the time I wanted on my, on my degree to experiment with things, different materials, explore, uh, collaborate, and just spend sort of a, a long period of time focusing on things that I was particularly interested in, which surround ideas um, relating to body and space, materiality, experience. And I think in a way, you know, all of these these areas are so important uh, for interiors. I know, of course, these things overlap with the architectural profession too. Um, but at the same time, I guess we're really shining a light on, on these specific things. And, and that sort of makes us stand out as, as interior designers. That's, that's really important. I mean, um, as well, I guess there is, I know this might be another question as well, but the, the sort of argument between, you know, what's the difference between the two? Um, and, you know, maybe it's it's something that we, we don't necessarily need to uh, worry too much about putting mm. a label on. Um, instead, you know, think of ways that what you're doing in your profession is is changing the ways we might think about being an interior designer or an architect in the future. We already know that the role of interior designers and architects has changed significantly over time and will continue to do so. Um, but, yeah, maybe there's new new areas to explore and discover within within interior design. Yeah. I, mean, I can speak just, I think I've got a little bit to say just on the trends in, in architecture education, and I would agree that there's some sort of redefinition going on. Um, but I'd say that there are, there is a sort of trend, I think, where education is um, getting closer and closer to industry. Um, you see it with you know schools like the LSA, which are really great institutions, and what Neil was doing there is like fantastic, and it's a really it's a really good school. But it what it is is like a bit of evidence to show that um, I think design education is getting quite um, there's a lot of pra practice coming into the university, and personally i think the university is a space where we are kind of free from the constraints of the real world and you know we we have the kind of space here to kind of imagine other ways of living other ways of um kind of being together as kind of society so 
um, I would say that, you know, for me, interior design offers that um, kind of way of thinking, where I, whereas I think in architecture, there is a sort of trend towards um, kind of drilling down to kind of practicalities just on day one. And I just find that a little bit limiting for me. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree about the practical. There was something I tried, I kept trying to think about this question and I kept going back to myself and being like, oh, I'm just like, I'm just going backwards and forwards, I can't really answer it. But the practicality thing was one reason why I think within studying architecture was really brilliant in a way that it was hugely creative at undergraduate, um, used lots of narrative, et cetera, et cetera, develop characters through my work. And I think I had quite a, a big realisation when I went into interviews to work in offices that I wasn't going to be doing that straight away. I was like, OK, maybe at some point in my future I'm designing stuff with a team. But I think I felt a bit itchy to sort of be making my own stuff or space now. And I think that's what the interesting thing about theatre design is like there are rules. There has to be rules because you have actors on the stage that you have to keep safe. But really, like it pushes the boundaries Like you can't. So the same with heights and sort of structures um, and how secure they might be. You can't really ask a member of the public to climb up a, a ladder with like rungs this far apart mm. to go to a bar, but obviously on stage, it's like there's a lot more leeway. And, it, and I found that really fulfilling. Um, and I think in terms of, yeah, interior design, I guess to me straddled both those things and it felt like somewhere in the middle. And I was writing down like, oh, is it because there's more attention on sort of colour and texture and materiality and experience. I was like, I don't know, I feel like there is an architecture as well. Um, I found it quite hard, quite hard to um, define. And I think, I guess really now the similarities that I was trying to work out between interior design and set design, again, it's another really difficult thing to try and establish. Like not all plays or stories are set within an interior, but a whole lot are. Like, do you argue that you're within an interior already once you're inside a theatre? because you're working to those boundaries and those parameters of what that space can do, whether that be how high you can have something, whether that be what you can fit through the dot doors to, to build the set. So, but then you think about theatre that's perhaps site specific or out in the open, it's like, guys, I'm not giving you any answers. I'm doing that. <laughs> I'm going to throw the questions back <laughs> Um Yeah. So, I, I was going to say, I think my perspective might be slightly different because I'm older and I, and it does make a difference actually because I studied interior design. I come from London, I went to Nottingham specifically to get out of London to see another place. And people were saying, oh, what's out of London? Why, why would you leave? And I'm glad I did it because I then saw other cities and I had a great sort of student life and I loved it. But at the time, interior design was very much a separate thing from architecture. And there was almost um, a battle between architects and interior designers and I say that things have changed because now there are courses that are called interior architecture mm -hmm. and I think that has changed because um, there is still this as you say it's a you know interior design is a young industry there is still this sort of you know conflict sometimes between interior designers and architects and they think that interior designers are you know, are not serious about what they do. I worked in a company with 400 architects, there were 25 interior designers and we were called the Fluffies. They didn't take us seriously, but we were involved in every single project. And, um, you know, that was when I started and I started working in commercial office interiors. So most of my experience is commercial, it's not residential. Although some of the images you see are residential, people still think, oh, interior designers just design homes, they just design apartments, they don't do things that are serious. And I think, there has been a big shift, thankfully, over the years, so that now interior designers can be taken seriously because we have something to offer. And I think, you know, what I wanted to do is come into education, as I say, because it's very rewarding. As, as you said, Pierre, you know, you are why we're here. And I'm still learning. I've been doing this a long time, but every day and every time I come here, I come here two days a week, I actually sort of feel that I've gained something by being here and, and listening to what you're saying. And I, 
don't want to be like the tutors that I had. I want to be better than that. And so I'm happy that interior design has moved closer to architecture. And there are differences because there's a difference in attitude. And that's because I've worked with architects and I've worked with designers. And there's still a divide in the bigger wide world. And I'm glad that, you know, we're trying to kind of um, make that divide smaller and see that it's about space, it's about experience, it's about the built environment, whether that's a, a yacht or whether it's a school or whether it's a block of, you know, apartments. So I feel that it's almost, it's not like it's my duty, but I feel that I, I can't just sit back. I want to contribute. And, and the other thing I would say is that I recognise that good education can make a huge difference. And I say that because I come from a family of five and I'm the only one who went to university and I went to a completely different school just by chance um, to my siblings. And I'm a very different person because of it. And the, the reason is because I was encouraged all the time to do whatever and think whatever. And it's made me a different person to my brothers and sisters. I mean, they're great people, but I know because of that, the environment that I was in, I, I've been able to do things that differently. And so I feel that it's, um, I just can't just, you know, leave it. I have to be involved in it and do, do my best to help. Uh, I would like to move to the next section, but at the same time, I want to come back to Kazu asking us why are we asking this question? <laughs> um, I feel like at RCA, or like in other schools where you have interior design courses and architecture courses, we look at our peers in architecture. And at least in the UK, the education of these two courses are completely different. So architecture professor, it's protected. Uh, they have a body that protects uh, RIBA. Uh, you have to go through the three-part system. And the thing is like, even if you are a qualified architect at the end, you can still call yourself an interior designer. An interior designer who went through like interior design course can't call himself an architect. But I feel like that's true. The We, we start merging and I hope, because we're still dealing with the same thing at the end, uh, with space. Uh, and I wanted to shift the conversation about adapting and evolving practice uh, because the future of academia has a direct relationship with the future of all of our practices. And so the, ne the next question is, how have you seen your practice evolve over time? And what direction would you like to see it move towards in the future? Uh, yeah, I can talk if you want. I think I'm happy to. Um, so I'd say, you know, the practice of SOS School SOS is directly driven by um, students like guys like you. Um, and the way we put uh, School SOS together is by putting seminars on and speaking with students about what they want um, and then working with them and putting it in practice. Um, so, you know, the future of practice, which is, that's the question, right? And how it links to academia. Um, I would love for the future practice to be more socially and politically aware. And, you know, this is like, this is our mantra. It's our mission at SOS. Um, and what we also do there is, is essentially we're trying to help young practitioners defining their own practice and often they are new ways of thinking about space and politics and it means something usually quite um, uh, individual to, to the student themselves and sometimes there is no precedent um, so uh, yeah I guess broadly we're I'm super super interested in exactly that like the future what is the future of spatial practice um, I love thinking about different ways of thinking about spatial and, and political practice. Um, you'll see some of the students' work like flicking up behind us. Um, the, the image with the ants piled on a bunch of logs on a boat is uh, some student work. Um, there's a, I think the image after that is um, to kind of typifies what, what we're thinking about and what we do. SOS is a student was interested in how to express themselves and, and express themselves politically in, in Hong Kong following the new security um, bill. Um, and, you know, she was really 
troubled by what was going on there. And um, in the end, we kind of came about thinking about how to protest in a subtle way. Um, and in the end, we used um, Strava, right? It kind of maps where you've been in the city. Um, and we came up with a kind of Google, a kind of fake Google review um, that took you kind of travel around the, the Hong Kong, the city center. And it ends up that you kind of actually spelling out a kind of pro pro an image, here we go, a kind of graphic that meant something about the kind of protests. Um, so this is the kind of way that we, we, we like to think spatially and politically, and we, I call that design work. Uh, I don't know what you think or, or the panel think, but um, there was design work going, going into that. So that's my sort of like vision of what future, future practice could be and how that ties into kind of SOS and academia. Um, yeah, that's the, there's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> It doesn't it doesn't have to tie back to the academic side of things it just, can just be about your practice and the future of your practice so yeah i, can talk a about that. I mean well my practice is mainly academics so maybe that's <laughs> i can move on to somewhere else um <laughs> but um yeah so um my practice is mostly teaching and it's something i got into quite early after completing the ma um it started out uh, helping out on different courses um, helping out with reviews on the panel, um, helping set up exhibitions, curate shows. And over time, um, my roles have become sort of more and more prominent and embedded uh, within universities. Um, and I guess with that, I guess the, the sort of the interesting thing, whether that's difficult or challenging, is that the more sort of teaching academic work, the less sort of practice based sort of industry work. So I think it's it's sort of quite interesting to think about the different directions, different avenues you might explore. Um, but at the moment, I'm pretty much full time uh, teaching alongside doing a practice based PhD, which I consider as as my practice. And that feeds in, I think, really well with everything that we do here um, and, and, and other and other courses that I teach on, too. Um, but I guess as you as you do um, sort of teach, as I have uh, taught and progressed uh, in, in lecturing and teaching um, and roles become more prominent and um, there's a lot more responsibility and you, you do a lot more uh, work that's not sort of on the ground uh, tutorials and teaching but there might be a lot more uh, curriculum planning, um, working with marketing departments, admissions, interviews, there's lots of behind the scenes things happening that I'm also sort of really interested in finding out the dynamics and and the sort of things that that you see also happening at universities um, as well and and that's really fascinating so I'm really interested in, in continuing to explore that uh, moving forwards uh, with PhD uh, it's practice based and doing it part-time alongside uh, the teaching and and that in a way is is focusing on a real life project so I'm um, I'm engaging with um, communities and stakeholders um, regularly, um, and that's that's helping to build my research. So, so it's it's sort of not not a speculative project, but it's it's a project that's happening now, uh, real time, um, and and impacting on different things. So that's something else that I'm currently doing and really enjoying, um, and just yeah, enjoying the moment at the moment with that. Yeah. <laughs> um, future of practice yeah um yeah i think the industry i work in is i guess it's in a really difficult time at the minute the the industry is crumbling post pandemic um as i'm sure all you guys are aware with the loss of as with all of our work as well all those projects all those theatres all those pro all that programming just stopped and the theatre industry isn't quite recovering I think the Arts Council is in crisis I think there's not enough funding there are positive things starting to happen I think the real um I guess it's like I don't want to not be excited about it but it is a challenge it's a really difficult industry to work in at the minute um what in what makes me excited what inspires me is the fact that the there are more doors opening in into literally the doors onto the stage like people that are being invited to share their stories voices that aren't 
ever, have never been heard on stage before. I think diversity within theatre and story, storytelling and programming is increasing hugely. I think we're getting rid of the dinosaurs and I think there's a real shift in um, a new, and a, a, I don't know, fresher <laughs> um, people that are taking over these spaces and holding the power. And I think that's really exciting. And I just hope that in terms of funding, Arts Council, it can come back to support that. Um, the NPOs, which are the national portfolio organisations, I'm probably going to get some of these details a little bit wrong, but every uh, few years, the Arts Council uh, distributes a large amount of money to different organisations, such as museums and theatres. And what happened this year was a, a huge amount of that was taken out of London um, and pushed to other cities in the UK, which I think is is really, really brilliant. But I think what what's happened within London is the Hampstead Theatre, for example, theatre, for example, is a purely new writing theatre. They only programme new writing. That means they get people's in to, to commission them to write their story or their play, and they work with a whole range of people. You know, they've lost all funding, so they can't continue to do that. So I think it's, yeah, it's a little bit difficult. Um, I think advances in technology, and I think could be quite exciting. Like, I think the, there's a lot of theatre that was shown on screen through the pandemic. I don't think that necessarily works that well. Um, <laughs> I think if you've got the RSC doing it or the National Theatre with multi-camera setups, huge teams, lorries, trucks outside filming it, it can start to work. But when it's a small theatre <laughs> or it's in the round and yes, you just can't, it's never the same experience as seeing live art. But what that does do is that brings theatre into people's homes, that brings those stories in uh, to people that might not you know, be going to the theatre. So that's it. I think the, the future is with the, the young people and um, with community and participation in my industry. <laughs> um, yeah, I would say that the direction that I can see going in is that, um, because I'm sort of involved in it, and I want to do more on here, is where practices <laughs> are opening their doors more to academia so um, allowing students to kind of come and visit and I think that's really important because what what's really key is that what you're learning and uh, experiencing here needs to be relevant um, so rather than you know lots of people being sort of educated and then you know let out and then going to jobs that don't exist i think it's absolutely important the practices and professionals understand what your desires are and what you want for the future and therefore you know having studio tours and talks is is absolutely vital because you are the employers or employees of the future and so that crossover is definitely changing because i i also work with other universities like um Plymouth for instance and they get practices involved in the in the, the courses and setting uh you know projects as well I think that really helps so that you're not learning something that isn't relevant but actually you could influence what those companies are doing and say well this is what really matters to us because this is this is our future it's not you know future of people that I you know myself but people that are your age um so I think there's a shift and the other thing I would say that's changed in my practice is that I work as we've all said collaboration is a key thing but my collaboration and I'm sure this has happened to everyone else has become even more stretched in terms of um location so I have a colleague who's based in Portugal but it doesn't matter he's based in Portugal because we still speak the same language and we have the same ideas and we're working on a project in Greece so the, um, my projects have become more international but it's not been a difficult thing because of technology and innovation in fact it's a lot easier and it makes things exciting as well but then I have a project that's in Chiswick um, but again the people I'm working with collaboratively are not all in London so that has some that's something that's changed and it's become almost not automatic but it's something you can take for granted that you're going to be working with people that are not in the same time zone or the same space as you and I think that's a good thing because it opens up your mind to possibilities and the last thing I'd say is I have a friend who used to work for me who's now based in Portugal he comes from South Africa he works with people in um, Australia and America to do his his project so he's completely global um, and it has been able to turn around a very successful interiors business um, which he's very proud of and he should be because he's worked very hard so that has been because of technology but also um quite an open mind to people you you look for the best colleagues doesn't matter where they are i think that's a big change mm -hmm.
the future of practice, right? So as I said, um, my practice is shifting to research base from this year. So if you're enjoying uh, doing our research on research uh, in this year, then I hope that we'll continue for the future uh, practice as well. Um, what we're doing, well, like what we're feeling now, and that's also related to your answer. Um, what we're feeling now is um, Arctic, so to say, like we call this architectural recipes. So the ingredients to create the architecture is changing. And also therefore like um, the methodology, construction methods should be changed. But then like, architecture is really complicated it's regulated by the laws while the interior design or like something else spatial design is not that hard to create so what we have in um, not in here now but uh, in the slide they are there is no architecture basically like optional architecture is not in the slide that is something like what we were working on these days so uh, when so the pavilions for example they were like small enough so we don't have to call it as an architecture so we don't have to care about the building regulations then those building regulations is quite a difficult thing to uh, go around we are building like um uh the off like normal building no not normal but like housing so like 400 square meters or whatever those buildings we're building but then they are really affected by those building regulations which is quite classic idea of architecture then there are lots of lots of different like um like validation of materials you can't use. But while like in Italian design, you can do basically like quite many different things. And if you have like lots of freedom. And also this course, like um, this is not our IBA part two, right? But then because of that, we're free from our IBA. So we can teach whatever we want to teach and be what we think as important for the spatial practice. So that's also for me is an architecture, but that is not architecture in the official way so you don't care about these like titles or like how you label your projects i think that's uh, that's quite important way of thinking for the next generations because as i said like architecture is like in the in the phase to redefine itself well, what is architecture then how we build is also shifting and the ingredients itself is also shifting um, because of sustainability or like because of new materials available then what we wish is to test out those materials those were like all built by acrylics and um, how we can build these um, if we if we built like architecture architecture then we cannot do that but since like it's small we can do what we think as an architecture, then that's the same as interior design, I think. So yeah, don't think like that interior architecture thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's hard when it's taught separately. I think yeah. that there's yeah, this yeah. inherent difference, yeah. um, but there isn't. So that the way it's taught, or like we should see the positive side of it. It's uh, we are given the freedom to do so. Then let's enjoy that. Mm -hmm. By like architecture, like very struggled. I always struggle with building regulations because that's basically not allowed for me to do whatever I want to do. So then always hit by the permissions or whatever. So yeah, let's uh, let's see the positive side of it. Yeah. All right, to wrap things up, um, there's one question that we kind of ask all of our inside out guests to answer at the end of their lecture, which is, do you have any advice for us as students or as people starting out their careers? Very practical. Any, anything, anything, whatever, whatever advice um, that you Since have. like we are basically art students, so we don't know about business and economy and tax systems and stuff. So my <laughs> practical <laughs> advice could be hire an accountant because that is something I really struggled. I, st I started my practice just like after I graduated from the school. So I have no idea about the economy or like tax or... VAT or like those kind of like um, the real world calculation and architecture like architecture like interior design whatever those are really primitive business model so that exists since four thousand years ago like two thousand years ago then we're really classic business so we should know about that and we should know a little bit about business then that kind of like opens up your mind to what's actually going on in the society that's um that's very practical but very helpful I think. Yeah, a piece of advice I would say is that, and I didn't do this, is that perhaps you should have some sort of idea or some sort of plan that you want to have in terms of the direction you want to go 
in, whether you want to go into hospitality or, or, or some other kind of sector, but then don't be fixed by that. Allow yourself freedom within that a very general plan because life happens and things come along and opportunities um, may arise that you weren't expecting. So I think be open-minded to what might be um, suggested to you or come come your way and think, why not? You're young enough, you, you've got time to explore it and do other things. So, so don't be too fixed. And I would say that whilst you're doing that, you're building up colleagues friends and people that you can come back to and that's happened to me and you work with them in the future and and that's your networking without even thinking of it as networking so I think you know when you work with somebody and you click with somebody and you have the same sort of um, language and you get on with them and you like them you know keep in touch with people it does help you it could help 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 you 10 years later two months later and i would say you know always leave a job on good terms no matter what happens i've done that <laughs> i think following on from from that um i think definitely keep an open mind uh don't try to force yourself into sort of um directions or preconceived ideas that that might be made uh, really be open to you know, taking on opportunities, trying things out, experimenting, exploring it as, as much as you can. I think that's that's so important. Uh, I think um, another bit of practical advice, if you've got an idea for a project um, in real life, outside of uni, um, do, just do it. Don't even think of twice. I think find collaborators, put a little PDF together, and just send send them out and just get on with it. I think don't delay because you've got so much energy here at university. And if you do go into practice, I'm telling you that energy <laughs> could <laughs> dip. And I just think use use this moment now and just keep going, keep going, keep going. And don't be afraid to just don't be afraid to just send that PDF out because you'll be really surprised what comes back. Like you guys are very talented. You're here for a reason. Um, I'm sure you can make a PDF sing. I know you can. So um, yeah, that would be my advice. Mine is um, absolutely agree with all the advice in the accountant thing for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Took me a while yeah. and it's not cheap, but it's worth it. Now, someone once said this to me, and I hope that I've stuck to it, and that is not to be a dick. And I think <laughs> it's as simple as that. You guys will have success. You will. Um, for me, I think you need to, you know, treat people with kindness and look after each other and support each other. Um, and I think, you know, not to run away with it. I think it's much more exciting when someone might be rising, you know, to grab those other people and bring them up as well do you know what I mean rather than it be competitive because I don't think we're on the, this planet for that reason um and similarly like Simon said I think it's okay it's good to make a plan but it's also okay to to shift and to shuffle through it and to um you know we're always learning and we're all changing we're we're all still learning and we will do the rest of our lives and what we do as a profession may still change um yeah well that's mine Thank you so much. I'm going to start thinking about the PDFs and the taxes. <laughs> uh, we will now open, uh, uh, we'd like to open up the panel to the questions from the audience. <laughs> um, I have a first question for Amelia. Oh. <laughs> I was wondering, um, just on the topic of resilience and on the topic of, um, like, I think something for that's always been back in my mind is surviving in London mm -hmm. and what that means um, and how expensive it is to even exist in the city. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you guys can comment on that and what that means, especially because there's this tension of wanting to do what you, what you want to do and protecting your own practice and protect and, and sort of like thriving intellectually. Mm -hmm. But there's also the realities of, of just paying like mortgage and everything. So I think you can yeah, speak to that. I absolutely agree. I mean, obviously times have changed since uh, everything's got a lot more expensive 
for, for everyone recently. Um, that's changed from doing my postgraduate in London. And I cannot emphasize enough that it's okay to have a side hustle. It's okay to um, have a, a job. Like I worked in Wagamama, Leicester Square, for two years whilst I was doing short courses. Uh, it's actually really brilliant because you get all day to sort of do creative work. Um, and then it was quite good money as well because there's lots of tips. And then I worked at the Curzon Cinema in Soho for a good few years whilst I was doing, leading into my postgraduate and during it. And that was amazing because not only was I being exposed to all these brilliant films I could watch for free, everyone else that worked there was doing, I don't know, we had like a sculptor, a writer, obviously some filmmakers. And I think it was finding the joy in that. So actually, it, it, I'm, I miss it a little bit. I miss um, going to work and not thinking about stuff. <laughs> thinking about pressures and budgets and like delivery you know and having that time to then in the days to be truly free in my thoughts um that would be my advice I think yeah it's possible it's difficult um yeah I would just say I mean it helps having friends having partner having family you know people that are around you that love you and care about you um it's not like you're a burden you can you know be resourceful as well and when I started when I decided to set up my own thing after working for lots of different people I told every single person I knew and it worked because one person said oh I've got a bathroom to design you can you design my bathroom and he's still a friend and it was a tiny five thousand pound budget but it helped me set up and and start and so I think you you kind of you've probably got a network that you're not even using and I, I agree with Amelia that you know it's absolutely fine to have a side hustle everybody knows that's how you need to survive and whatever it is whatever works for you I mean you could do extras work there's loads of filming work around London and the UK um, and 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 that's something that you know is free to sign up with so there's lots of agencies that do that so there's a lot of different things you don't have to work in a shop or a restaurant but that could be what you enjoy because it becomes a social thing so I think be resourceful um, there's a lot of opportunities out there. Mm -hmm. I would say like um, I'm relatively new in London I just moved in three years ago but then like what I found is like there's so many artist community and artist opportunities and artist fundings as well so just explore there mainly in the east but explore there then you find somehow um, what you want um, from that community, like um, it could be a space, it could be a studio, it could be, like, it could be a workshop, whatever. Then that community is quite strong in London. That wasn't like in Japan or like in Copenhagen. So there are like lots of lots of opportunities as well. It's very competitive, but it's it's very hard. But at the same time, like, it's like very strong local communities of artists. So that's um, something I found really fun. Um, one thing I'd add is that there, there's probably things that you've done before this course as well. So you've got like transferable skills. You may have been an artist, you may have been a model maker or something like that. So that's another way you could earn money by working for a company that needs that on a kind of freelance basis. You can just be resourceful about what you can do for them. So don't just think of it as, oh, you need to have a job that is like a, going into a space, but you might be able to freelance on some basis. Any other questions from the gents? Uh, question for Pierre. Um, if you have any extra projects going spare, do send them away. Is there anywhere, is there anywhere you'd recommend looking <laughs> for these extra projects uh, yeah. if you're new to the industry? What do, you, what do you mean, extra Little bits, projects? Bits well, yes. of work on the side or opportunities to, yes. to explore. Where am I sending? So, I mean, okay, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know if I can give you a list of places that are looking, but I tell you, um, that piece of advice just comes from Kish, my colleague, and I setting up SOS. And I'm probably there's probably millions of other very similar stories of us coming, you know, after the pub, fresh out of the pub, the next week, what are we going to do? How do we put this idea together? We're not together in a PDF. And then just sent it to the Design Museum and South London Gallery and some other institutions. And then, yeah, you pester them for a couple of weeks, but then it comes back and then there's a meeting. And then suddenly, you know, you really got your foot in and then you might be able to make a little 
print a little make a kind of booklet thing that tells your story a bit more and then you bring that to the meeting again it's just a piece of like design that all of you can do um but it's something kind of tangible and then you can have a, and then you have your meeting and then you're kind of in and there's a project there that that was that's my that was our experience and it's just crazy to think that all it was was like a pdf you know a 10 page pdf that anyone could do and i suppose yeah maybe the idea works and that clicked and maybe that's what helped it along but um so to, to your question if you've got potential collaborators that you know you want to work with just send it to them um that's going to be specific to you and your what you want to do um so yeah, hope that helps. <laughs> I think you could also Sorry. look for design competitions and things like that, mm -hmm. like that. I know you think, oh, maybe it's more work, but it might not be too much work. Mm -hmm. That could help you as well. And also, like there is like innovation hub in LCI in the different campus, but that is like lots of opportunities in there. Then it could be like an architectural, like a spatial proposition. Um, so yeah, social media too. <laughs> so many things. Uh, become available mm. really exciting and linkedin actually is useful <laughs> yeah, it is very useful i get work through linkedin you need to kind of just be uh visible thank you uh, let's say you didn't plan on going to university what are the best courses that you could do to get into the field of interior design so well, sorry, come on. I'm just trying to understand the question. Is it as in? But you're at uni now. Is you? Is no. this for a friend or? <laughs> no. Well, it's for a friend, but they don't go to university. And they would yeah. like to do interior design, so they wanted to know if there's any courses mm. that you would recommend to do. There are lots of courses you can do online. Um, so I would look at that, first of all, and it depends on the time you have, the budget you have, and, and the, you know, how committed you are. So online courses is, is, is a good introduction because you will find out quite quickly whether interior design is something for you or not. And I taught at Chelsea College of Art for a while on and off and there were like one day courses there were five day courses and they were like an introduction to interior design and you didn't have to have any qualifications in it at all to do the course and they were quite affordable so that's a good way for somebody who has no sort of degree or anything in it to to um explore and then if you do have more funds if you you know saved up you could go to a an independent school like the interior design school or klc or something like that where they have uh much more expensive you know, one year diploma courses and that way you get a qualification and it's quite intense usually costs like twenty thousand plus so there's lots of different ways of getting in, into interior design without having a degree in it so it's really just about googling and and researching online initially uh, my sorry i'm just going to say i would ditch the in trying to find interior design specific because you know there's load there are just a load of free uh alternative schools out there that just do design and you sh they could like tailor their experience at that school towards interiors if that if that's something they're interested in so it's just off the top of my head open school east is in margate there's another margate design school i think they're both free or just not very much money at all um myom i think it is um which is basically like design your own masters which is a i think a free course that's picking up pace um so i i would and there's a bunch of others there's loads um that maybe maybe i can find out for you uh, i can give to you but maybe maybe that's my bit of advice just don't um attach to the interior because as our discussions have kind of said, the, the interior is wider, and so is architecture. So maybe it's just design, finding kind of alternative free design school. Yeah, I did a short, I did, I think it's what Simon was saying. So at Chelsea, I did two mm. short courses. Um, one was in theatre design, one was in costume design. And it was like, I don't know, one evening a week for a month or something like that, or you could do it in tents in a week. And it was affordable. Um, and that, yeah. Actually, in that set design course, I was taught by the, the person who then taught me on my on my postgraduate. So it all sort of led into it. But it was a really great introduction with like no pressure. I guess it was a bit more for someone that might be working full time. 
um, during it, like an evening thing, no pressure to do work in between it, but really great introduction with some really great teachers. Yeah, yeah, yeah there's lots of different short courses. Uh, I mean, it depends on your other experience that you have, but there is, you can also do a foundation course, which is a bit more open, and that's about testing and exploring and experimenting. Um, and then might be depending on the course, different um, areas that you might want to choose. One of them could include interior design that, that could give you a sort of overview of the subject area and help you explore those ideas. Alt, Alt MFA is another course. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's slowly sort of coming back. <laughs> yeah, and it is specifically interior design, the British Institute of Interior Design, BIID. You could look at their website. Um, they will have lots of information. And open days, open days at different universities and colleges and institutes and organisations, they will be able to help too. So then you, you can have a look at what's available without any commitment. Right then, thank you very, very much for tonight. And um, thanks so much for agreeing to join Inside Out. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming.